Okay, this is the blood lecture. Uh, blood composition. This is if we had uh, centrifuged a uh, sample of blood, what we would see. Um, blood function is that it transports the vital substances for our body. Um, maintains the stability of our interstitial fluid. Um, it distributes heat. Blood, the amount of blood someone has depends on how big they are, how um, hydrated they are, so their fluid concentration, electrolyte concentration, and um, how much adipose tissue they have. Blood makes up about 8% oh, of your body weight. So it's about 8% of the body weight. And each person on average has about 5 liters of blood. Um, you can see that most of the blood is plasma. And then you have um, the red blood cells, which makes up about 45%, and a very small portion that we call this buffy coat is white blood cells and platelets. Okay, blood cells come from, um, all blood cells come from this thing called the hematopoietic stem cell. So this is the stem cell for all blood cells found in the bone marrow. And you can see, now I wouldn't memorize all of these pathways, but it's just important to know that these hematopoietic stem cells are the progenitor cells for all of these. And then you've got um, pro-urethroblast becomes the erythrocyte, okay? And um, the erythrocytes are what's actually find inside our blood, but all of its precursors are forming in the bone marrow. For the white blood cells, uh, for the granulocytes either, um, you uh, have one cell after the hematopoietic stem cell, and for the um, agranulocytes, you've got, they each have their own um, precursors. So like a monoblast becomes the monocyte. The lymphoblast T cell becomes T lymphocyte. Lymphoblast B cell becomes B lymphocytes. Okay. So big picture, hematopoietic stem cells are the stem cell for all blood cells. And the path that each blood cell takes depends um, on what the precursor cells are. So the... Uh, red blood cells have a different precursor than, say, the platelets, who have their mega, uh, mega uh, karyoblast <clears throat> versus the granulocytes versus the agranulocytes. All right, let's talk about red blood cells specifically. Red blood cells are called the erythrocytes. They are... Um, Biconcave, I'm sorry, yeah, biconcave. Okay, which means they're kind of like a jelly donut that has been squished in the middle. Um, they are one third hemoglobin. <clears throat> One third oxyglobin and one third deoxy hemoglobin. Okay, these um, 
white blood, I'm sorry, the red blood cells don't have nuclei. So a mature red blood cell does not have nuclei. So therefore it can't divide on its own. And the reason it doesn't have the nuclei is we need these cells to be flexible. So it doesn't have the nuclei. Oh, and the other thing it doesn't have is, so it has no nuclei and no mitochondria. Remember, the mitochondria are the cell organelle used for cellular the respiration to get energy. So these red blood cells are flexible, and that way they can squeeze through those capillaries. Red blood cell count, um, and really the red blood cell count reflects how much oxygen the, um, the blood can carry. And it's reported in uh, number of red blood cells in a cubic millimeter of blood. So males have uh, 4,600,000 to 6,200,000 red blood cells in each cubic millimeter of blood. Females have less and children, mainly because of their size, have less. Red blood cell production so when we get low blood oxygen, it causes the kidneys and the liver to release a hormone called erythropoietin. And that hormone erythropoietin goes into the bloodstream, goes to the bone marrow, and it stimulates the red blood cell production in the bone marrow. So those hematopoietic stem cells are stimulated to become um, red blood cells. Then when we're carrying enough oxygen, so we have high enough red um, blood oxygen, then the negative feedback tells the kidneys and the liver to stop producing erythropoietin. Red blood cells need um, lots of vitamin uh, B12, lots of folic acid, and obviously iron um, to be formed. Life cycle, uh, red blood cells from the time they're mature last about 120 days. So they're about 120 days lifespan. <clears throat> when they get old, uh, there are, and they're passing through the spleen and the liver, so there's the liver, um, but passing through the spleen and the liver, these white blood cells will destroy them, so these macrophages will destroy them. The hemoglobin is broken down into heme and um, globin. The iron goes back to the bone marrow. I feel like this is somewhere in here. All right, here, hemoglobin, right here. Um, iron goes back to the um, red bone marrow so that it can make use be make more red blood cells. And then the byproducts of that are bilirubin and biliverdin, and those get excreted in the bile. So that gives a lot of color to your feces. Sometimes we don't have enough red blood cells. When that happens, we get type of anemia. These, all these types of anemia are based off of what caused them and what the results are. So an aplastic anemia is when the bone marrow is damaged. And that's usually due to something, um, aplastic is due to something like uh, your uh, toxic chemicals or... Uh, radiation exposure, or acute radiation exposure. You get aplastic anemia. Hemolytic anemia is when um, the red blood cells get destroyed and that's um, hemolytic anemia is due to acute toxic chemical exposure. Sickle cell anemia is a defective gene that causes the cells 
sickle cell anemia causes the red blood cells because of this effective gene to instead of being like this causes them especially when they get low on oxygen to be sickle shaped okay um, iron deficiency anemias is exactly what it sounds like you have low iron and you can't make enough mature red blood cells pernicious anemia is um, Pernicious anemia, anemia is lack of vitamin B12 or the inability to absorb B12. And so you get a lot of immature red blood cells. Thalassemia is um, when we have a deficiency in the uh, hemoglobin and the red blood cells are, are functional but they're very short-lived and that's due to a genetic um, uh, defective gene. So these bottom two are both defective genes. <clears throat> and this just looks at some of those. So there's a hemolytic anemia with those normal red blood cells here and then um, these destroyed ones down there. White blood cells, also called leukocytes, protect against disease. Um, this is a very general statement, but interleukins and colony, colony stimulating factors stimulate their development. Three different kinds. There are the granulocytes, and the granulocytes are called granulocytes because it appears um, when you look at them on a the microscope that they have granules in them. So those are the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Remember, those all come from the same progenitor cells. And the eight granulocytes are the lymphocytes and monocytes. Neutrophils are the first, oops, neutrophils. Um, so neutrophils look like this, where they have um, these lobed nuclei. So these lobe nuclei. So these nuclei form different lobes. Um, these are the first ones to arrive at an infection, especially bacterial infections. They're phagocytic, so they um, devour those other cells, those bacterial cells. And this makes up the largest portion of our leukocytes. So the number that's Commonly used 54 to 62 percent. Um, and so if you say have a bacterial infection and they draw your blood and they see you have a leuco or a neutrophil um, numbers that are 75 or 69 percent, then they're gonna suspect it's probably a bacterial infection. Basophils. Uh, basophils release histamine and heparin. Okay. Histamine causes, um, well, heparin causes your blood to not clot, and histamine causes your blood vessels to become uh, leaky. <clears throat> you would find lots of basophils and say an allergic reaction or a place where the skin is damaged. And then this is less than 1% of your leukocytes. These are relatively big. Look, always compare these cells to the to the red blood cells because these ones are the red blood cells. And notice this one's pretty big compared to the red blood cells. So if it looks like it's granular and bigger than red blood cells, guess basophils. Eosinophils um, generally have a bilobed nuclei. So there's two lobes. There's one, and there's the other, and sometimes they'll be connected. And eosinophils um, make up 1% to 3% of our leukocytes. Their biggest um, role is to defend us against parasitic worm infestations. 
So parasitic worms that may infest us. Um, you'd find a lot of eosinophils in that kind of infestation. And they also help to moderate allergic reactions. Monocytes. Monocytes are the largest blood cell. It's huge. See how much bigger it is? Oops, sorry. See how much bigger it is than the red blood cells? It's huge. Usually has a kidney shaped. This one is very kidney shaped. Uh, or oval nuclei. This is, monocytes make up 3% to 9% of your leukocytes and um, monocytes leave the bloodstream or when they leave the bloodstream to go into some damaged tissue they become macrophages so they devour other cells or damaged cells um, you get an increase in monocytes in things like uh, diseases like oh, malaria um, typhoid fever, okay, and um, tuberculosis. So tuberculosis, malaria, typhoid fever. Lymphocytes. Notice lymphocytes are about the size of a red blood cell. And the nuclei generally take up the entire cell. Except you may have this very thin, like you see here, this thin rim of cytoplasm. Um, the two kinds of nucleo, nu of lymphocytes, sorry, are T cells and B cells. And when we get to the um, immune system, in a few weeks, we'll learn more about T cells and B cells and how they come to be. Um, so these play a role in immunity. Um, B cells, for example, produce antibodies. The T cells are the ones that are reduced in say an AIDS, um, uh, in someone who has AIDS, the T cells are the ones that are reduced. Lymphocytes make up 25% to 33% um, of all of your leukocytes. Diapodesis is the um, just how the leukocytes would leave the capillaries and enter the tissue. So they squeeze through that, um, through those slits to get into the tissue. All right, white blood cell counts. Once again, number per cubic millimeter of blood. And generally, it's anywhere from oh, 5,000 to um, 10,000 per cubic millimeter of blood. Leukopenia is a low white blood cell count. And um, Leukopenia, you see how with um, diseases like um, typhoid fever again, um, measles. Mumps, chicken pox, AIDS. Okay. Those all result in leukopenia. Leukocytosis 
is a high white blood cell count. So leukocytosis you get through um, when you have an acute infection. So the body's fighting something actively. Um, also, uh, exercise, vigorous exercise, or if you have a, a loss of uh, body fluids. That's more that with the loss of body fluids, you have less fluid in each cubic millimeter of blood. A differential white blood cell count is just list the percentages of your uh, different types of leukocytes and for different diseases it's going to change. So remember we talked about neutrophils will increase their percentage during a bacterial infection. All right, Blood platelets uh, are called thrombocytes. And remember these are that these are cell fragments um, of those uh, mega karyocytes. These look very small under the microscope. So it's 130,000 to uh, I think 360,000 per cubic millimeter. Oops. The blood. And the platelets are there to stop bleeding, so to help control blood loss from broken vessels. Blood plasma is the liquid portion of blood. It makes up, as we said earlier, about 55% of all the blood. The stuff in the plasma, though, are like electrolytes. It's mostly water. There's some proteins. We'll talk about these proteins. Waste, nutrients, and gases. nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Let's talk about those plasma proteins. Albumins. Um, albumins are the most numerous plasma proteins and they originate in the liver. So the most plasma proteins are albumins, originate in the liver, and they help maintain the osmotic pressure of the blood. Uh, fibrinogen it also originates in the liver and it helps to coagulate the blood. Uh, it's also in the liver and blood co coagulation. Okay, so it helps to clot the blood. Alpha and beta globulins, um, also from the liver. And These ones um, are the ones that are going to transport the lipids and fat soluble vitamins. Gamma globulins are from the lymphatic system, so from lymphatic tissues. And these um, are the antibodies for immunity. All right, gases and nutrients. So gases are like oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, nitrogen. And then nutrients, we've got amino acids, we've got sugars, nucleotides, and mostly those monomers from um, lipids, lipoproteins, any of those. All right, the plasma lipoproteins.
Chylomicrons are um, used to transport dietary fats to the muscles and adipose cells. These um, so chylomicrons, I mean that's pretty much it, transports the dietary fats to muscles and adipose cells. Uh, LDLs or yeah, actually, let me do LDLs right here. So the LDLs um, are, should start back with the VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins. So VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins, um, have a lot of triglycerides in them produced in the liver, and they're gonna transport triglycerides from the liver to the adipose cells. And the LDLs are formed from the VLDLs. And they deliver cholesterol to the various cells. These are low density lipoproteins. And lastly, you have HDLs, high density lipoproteins. And these have um, these transport the remnants of these chylomicrons to the liver. So when you go to get your cholesterol checked, generally you want to have your HDLs high and your LDLs low because the HDLs are bringing the cholesterol to the liver, whereas the LDLs are bringing them around the body. All right, the non-protein nitrogenous substances. Uh, urea is, um, re urea makes up most of your non-protein nitrogenous substances. And it's about 50% of them. And it comes from the breakdown of protein. So when we uh, catabolize protein, you get urea. Uric acid, it's a product of nucleic acid catabolism, so breaking down nucleic acids. Amino acids come from the breakdown of proteins. Remember, amino acids are what build or what make proteins. Creatine, these should be on separate lines. Creatine stores phosphates. And creatinine is a product of creatine breakdown. Bun is blood, um, blood, urea, nitrogen. Okay, and that really indicates it's used to measure the health of the kidney. Electrolytes, so the electrolytes are things like sodium, Potassium, calcium, magnesium, um, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, sulfates, sodium, and potassium are the most abundant ones. So let's look a little bit at how um, we clot our blood or, or at least help to fix a broken blood vessel. So the first thing that's gonna happen, this is how we're gonna stop the bleeding. So once you get this break in the wall, it causes the blood vessel to spasm. And that spasm means triggered by those pain receptors. The spasm mean helps to release platelets. I'm sorry, the spasm is also caused by the platelet uh, release or serotonin from the smooth muscle in the vessel helps it to contract. So once you get that, then you get the platelets actually forming, they're plug forming, and the platelets, um, when they touch collagen, remember collagen is that fiber that's in your tissues, especially like your skin, the um, platelets start to adhere to that rough surfaces. 
of the collagen and it helps to form the plug. <clears throat> okay, and so just the platelets contacting the foreign surfaces, you know, stuff that's not usually touching, like collagen, that's what causes them to stick together, and it helps to prevent the blood from leaking out more. There are extrinsic clotting me mechanisms and intrinsic clotting mechanisms. These are not separate, they work together. But the extrinsic clotting mechanism is when some chemical outside of the blood triggers, triggers the coagulation. So basically what we just talked about, the tissue damage. And there's, um, when the damaged tissue, so your skin got cut, which is something that's not usually touching the blood, it releases tissue, thrombo, excuse me, thromboplastin. Okay, and then don't memorize this entire pathway, but notice they both end up going to prothrombin activator, which converts fibrinogen um, to fibrin, and that's what causes the clot. The intrinsic one is some chemical inside the blood triggers the coagulation. Okay, and it's when something inside the blood touches a foreign um, surface. Okay, now people, some people are missing one of these factors, genetically missing one of these factors. It depends on which factor will depend on how badly um, or how much it affects them and, they, and if it affects their ability to clot their blood. Like you probably would not want to be missing one of these factors from way down here because they're really important um, for both pathways. More about blood clots. The platelet-derived uh, growth factor, that's one that's stimulating the smooth muscle cells and the fibroblasts to repair the damaged blood vessels. So this is what's causing um, that initial reaction to happen. When, um, once the blood clot's formed, the, it starts to retract, and as it heals, it pulls the edges of the broken vessels together. The plasmin is um, something that digests blood clots. It helps to break it down. Um, a thrombus is just an abnormal blood clot, like a blood clot that shouldn't be there. And that's an internal blood clot. An embolus is when that blood clot starts moving through the blood. All right, ABO, blood grouping. Um, there's something like 26 different blood types, you know, everywhere from A, B, and L being the most common to blood type G, which I think like six people in the world have. Um, just check that out. But the blood type refers to the actual antigen on the blood. Now remember when we talked about this, if you took biology recently, antigens are proteins that are just on the outside of the cells. And these antigens act as like little flags to say, hey, this is what I am, or this is that I'm supposed to be here. And our body has certain antigens. So if you have blood type A, it means you have A antigen on your blood cells. If you have blood type B, you have B antigen. And you have blood type O, you don't have any antigens on your blood cells. Okay? So you have no flag out there. And if you have blood type AB, you have both A antigens and B antigens. Now, here's where it can become confusing. That people who have blood type A have anti-B antibodies. Now remember, antibodies are part of the immune system, part of the immune system that attack things. 
So a person with A blood has antibodies against B blood, just like a person with B blood has antibodies against A blood. Now, people who have AB blood, who have their blood cells have both A and B antigens, they don't have any antibodies against A and B. And people who have type O blood have no antigens, have antibody A's and antibody B's. You might want to make like a little chart. Um, in your notes. So put a little table in there with say blood type and then which antigens and then which antibodies. Okay, Just so you can get this straight in your mind. Because people who have uh, blood type a, for example, and then you know, actually in the in your chart, add can donate to and can receive from. Okay, so blood type A, for example, has A antigens, and it has anti-B antibodies, anti-B antibodies. So they can donate blood only to A and AB. Um, and they can receive blood from anyone with A and O because O doesn't have any of the antigens, so their anti-B antibodies won't attack it. Blood type B um, has B antigens, and they can, oh, and they have anti-A antibodies. They can donate to B and AB, and they can receive blood from B and O. AB has A and B antigens, they have no antibodies. They can only donate um, to AB and they can receive blood from anyone because they have no antibodies to attack that blood. And blood type O has no antigens. They have anti-A and anti-B antibodies. They can donate to um, everyone, and they can receive blood only from O. Now, uh, not only this, but we also have the rhesus factor, which is positive or negative. And the rhesus factor is just um, another antigen, and if you have the rhesus factor, your Rh positive, and if you don't have it, you're Rh negative. So that means someone who has the rhesus factor can donate blood to, um, so someone who's A positive, they can donate to anybody who is A positive or AB positive. <clears throat> I think I said that right. Yes. But if um, you're A negative, you can donate to someone who's A positive or A negative. Um, so the universal donor, the person who can donate to anyone, is an O negative person because they don't have any antibodies. And the universal acceptor is someone who's AB positive. They can give blood from anyone. So this is what happens when you get the wrong blood type. So here's this person, um, and then they have this anti-A antibody, or they have this A blood, and they've got anti-B antibodies. Well, if their blood gets into someone else who has anti-A antibodies, so they donated to, to someone who had B blood, then 
those antibodies are going to cause all the blood cells to stick together. With the, we call that agglutination. And so this is what normal blood would look like. And this is the agglutinated blood. All the blood sticks together. And that's bad. Okay. Clinical application. Uh, we're going to talk about leukemia. So myeloid leukemia is um, when the bone marrow produces too many immature um, Im immature granulocytes. Okay. And if this is a cancer and the cells are being produced in there um, not functional, but it also it crowds out other blood cells. Okay, so the person is going to have anemia because they're not going to have enough red blood cells. They're going to have problems with bleeding because they won't have enough platelets, and they're very susceptible to infections because they're not going to have enough uh, white blood cells. Okay, because they're producing all these immature cells. Lymphoid leukemia is when the lymphocytes are cancerous. Okay, um, and the symptoms are similar to over here, but it's um, with the actual lymphocytes are the problem. So the treatments for these, for both of these, are blood transfusions, so you can get some good blood cells in there. Good red blood cells. Bone marrow transplants. And the bone marrow transplants are um, designed to get you stem cells that will match your cells as best as possible with the right antigens into your bone marrow so that you can start producing healthy cells. Anti-cancer drugs or direct stem cell transplants. Okay, that's it for the bone or the blood lecture.